ready uh, for that. But he's, he's a, what a what a blessing. Him and Miss Susan. Uh, blessed to be a blessing. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 21 through 25, and let me just say this. God did institute the marriage before the church. And God has an order to things. He wants us to be saved before we get married. Why? To be a blessing to our spouse. And not just uh, one occasion on our anniversary. And I'm so glad that God is not just a one-time blessing. He wants us to be a continual blessing to specifically our spouses because if you're a blessing to them you're going to be a blessing to others and you ought to be a blessing to your spouse and then as uh, if God sees fit to give you children since you've been a blessing to your spouse God then expects you to be a blessing to your children and again not just on their birthdays or graduation but a continual blessing God is a continual, everlasting Savior that gives you everlasting peace. And we're going to get to this in just a moment. Blessed to be a blessing, this is something in Scripture that we all can do. And as the Bible goes on at the end of Hebrews, as we study His Word, again, when you study the whole book of Hebrews, the author expects you to go through all the book. And then at the very end, now that you believe, now that you trust and by the way, I haven't said this, maybe I've never said this before, but in John 3, 16, when it talks about believeth, it's a continual belief. When you're saved, you are saying that I continue to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I will continue the rest of my life believing Jesus. So what you're also saying in saying that is that Jesus is the word, that you're going to believe his word. Continually. And to believe his word continually, you must be in his word continually. But tonight's sermon is blessed to be a blessing. So by the end of Hebrews, if you believe everything that the writer wrote, which we should, and we trust it and obey it and we apply it, by the end, you're going to be a blessing to others. Because you've been blessed. And that's the way... Uh, if you say the circle of life or the, the wheel turns, God wants us to be a blessing to others. Uh, that, we're, that, that song, Showers of Blessing, he gives you floods of joy. And again, when he blesses you beyond measure, it's not to just hold to yourself. It's to share with others. And, and I'm telling you, and I might get some pushback on this, and that's okay. It starts in the home. It starts in your marriage. And then it starts in the church. And again, I, I cannot re-emphasize uh, this enough. Scripture does say, and it points to that God instituted the marriage before the church. Therefore, we ought to treat our spouses more and be a blessing to them more than others. And when you are a blessing to others, listen, it catches on. And people see. But in these verses, verses 21 through 25, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Uh, another, I just have to pause here because I get irritated on some things. Uh, I get irritated even when Christians say that uh, salvation, you could lose it. We have an everlasting Savior. When he saves you, it's everlasting. When he blesses you, it's everlasting. A continual blessing. And again, that means that us as Christians, we need to be everlasting. Not just one day, not just on Sundays, but we need to be a blessing all the time. If you've been blessed, if you're saved, you've been blessed. Therefore, you ought to be a blessing to others. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
And I beseech you, brethren, and suffer the word exhortation. For I have written a letter unto you in a few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have rule over you, and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Lord, we're so grateful of how you continue to bless us. And some of us are ungrateful. Uh, this evening, I hope we understand and, and give you glory and be grateful for what you've done. And Lord, throughout this evening, uh, if I could hit home with your word, the way you have blessed us, those that are saved, we are to be a blessing to others. Not just a temporary, not just one day at a time, but how you bless. An everlasting blessing, a continual blessing. Lord, may this church may uh, be a continual blessing to you, Lee. For those that come in here, may it always be a place where people feel blessed. And Lord, we'll give you the honor and praise and glory in Christ's name. Amen. And as I was uh, thinking about this uh, sermon, I, I never know how I'm going to start. And sometimes, and I give the Ty and James notes sometimes, and I, I think sometimes, and I don't know if they do or not, I think, you know, where are these coming from? I don't see these in the notes here. Uh, I just know, never know how God's going to start out. And I take a deep breath. Okay, God, let it rip. <laughs> so uh, as I was coming up here uh, this evening, I was thinking about how this chapter is talking about being a blessing. We don't know who the author is. A lot of people believe it's Paul. And if it is Paul, the one person spending time in jail for something he didn't do, being mocked, being ridiculed, being beaten up, and here he is being a blessing to others. And he strives to be a blessing. He goes out of his way to be a blessing. In jail, he writes letters of not feel sorry for me. Can you come get me out? He writes letters of encouragement to others. And the one person that needs to be encouraged, and you can't make this stuff up. It's another way of God seeing, showing us that I don't care who you are or what, what you're going through, you can be a blessing to others. And here's another example of someone that you wouldn't think be a blessing because everything that's happened to him but God has used him as a purpose, putting him through things, and he's a blessing to others. What a blessing. Always writing to other churches saying how blessed I am that I have you, that you're praying for me, that you're thinking of me. And he's always encouraging the church. And what I'm saying is that's what we need to be is a continual blessing, no matter what we go through in life. To be a blessing. Uh, this morning, uh, as Brother Sal wasn't here, and Ty and, and Caleb, I gave them some songs, and one was not in the book, and it just blessed my heart that this went ahead and, and typed it in. It blessed me. Because I had another song ready. I told Fawn I have another song ready. I, I kind of think this is not in, in the book. And instead of them asking me for another song, they just went ahead and typed it in. And more or less, if I can talk on their behalf, and James has a mic, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. But I got the feeling is, if God's laid it on your heart to sing this song, we're going to do it. Who are we to stand in the way? And it blessed my heart. Because I kind of knew that that song wasn't there, and I had a backup ready. But I really wanted to sing that song this morning. And I think something, uh, the way we sung it, I don't think some of you have sung it before, you know, we're going to see the king. Hallelujah. Uh, I didn't, maybe it was in my brain, but I do think that Baptists say hallelujah a lot, and that wasn't my way of thinking this morning. But hallelujah to the king for being a blessing to us, for doing something that we don't deserve. He deserves all of our praise. So this is something that we all can do. We all can be a blessing. If you're saved, you can be a blessing why? Because you've been blessed. And that's the only reason why. 
through Jesus is you can be a blessing like Christ is to us. And God wants us that way. He's always conforming us to his son. As you read this verse, we have this everlasting covenant. And if you study this word and the word covenant, it means a divisory will, which means, if I can paraphrase, you must enter in this covenant in the presence of the person who made the covenant. You cannot be saved unless you go into the presence of God. You can't go to the presence of God unless you go through Jesus. So what this verse is saying that when you enter a covenant, you're doing it in the presence of the Lord. That's the only way to do it, is in the presence of Jesus. And what it also is saying is, to be a blessing, you must do it in front of God. That means not just putting on a show in church. That means in your everyday life, being a blessing to others. Seeing that God is seeing you for who you are. And it also means, uh, and this is the dictionary that says that there must be witnesses to do things. And we do things, and I think, again, I haven't said this in a long time, but I think Baptists don't do a good job of explaining why we do things. Uh, that's why uh, we uh, baptize people publicly. And if you're saved, you should be a witness or not be ashamed of being a witness or having witnesses around you before the Lord. So that's why we baptize in public, and the person that's being baptized is saying, I identify with Christ. And they're doing it publicly. And they're doing it in front of uh, people. And they're saying that I identify with this church. That I am doing this publicly. I have went, and uh, if you notice, I think sometimes the mic's not clear up there. And that's for some reasons, because we don't want the mic to get wet. I hope they don't want me to be electrocuted. Praise God, I, I know I talk about uh, Pastor Gregory a lot, but they try to get the mic closer to him. He got zapped uh, one time. So, but what I say before I baptize someone, and Brad's here, and he'll attest to this, the first thing I ask before I even baptize someone, I do it publicly. Have you accepted the Lord Jesus as your Savior? And I, told, I think I told Brad this. We had a little meeting back there. If you don't say anything, I won't baptize you. I have to wait. I have to say, I have to hear that yes, or I won't do it. You have to acknowledge that you have been saved, that you accepted Christ as your Savior. It's, all this would be useless if you don't. So a covenant means that you enter into it by the advisory, the person who wrote the contract, the person that is the covenant, and you do it in his presence. And again, that word uh, in believeth in John 3, 16 is believing, is continual. So when you get saved, you're saying, you're agreeing, and I hope you realize this, once you get saved, you're saying, I believe you for the rest of my life. I will continue to believe you. But what you're saying is when you accept Christ is you believe. And it's not just that one time. You're entering into a contract. You're entering into a covenant. And you're saying to, you, to Jesus and you're saying to the world, I believe Christ. I believe his word. I will continue to do so. I will continue to trust it. And I will continue to uh, obey it. If you've never heard that before, that's what you're saying if you're saved. And if you're not doing that, I have to question your salvation. Because as a saved individual, you will believe. You will believe the Lord Jesus. You will believe the whole word, not just parts of it. You would trust it, follow it, and believe it. And when you do that, you are blessed. And God will bless you. And you will become a blessing to others. And that's what this is uh, saying at this moment. I might get this right sometime. That word everlasting. The Energizer Bunny keeps on going. God just keeps blessing. He will always bless. Only Jesus gives that everlasting blessing. And once you're saved, that blessing, uh, one of those blessings is, is an everlasting peace. You will have, again, and that word is everlasting. That means if you trust Jesus, you will have peace in your life no matter what comes into it. 
you have a hard day at work, you're going to have peace because you have Jesus. If there's a death in the family, if there's heartache, God will give you peace through that. He's an everlasting God. And we need, that's why it irks me when someone says, it's like that nails on a chalkboard, when someone says you can lose your salvation, because then you're throwing everything out. You're saying that my Lord's not uh, eternal. You're telling me he's not continual. You're not telling me he's everlasting. How could you trust him then? I can trust my Savior. And not just one day. I can trust him with my whole life, with my life, every day. I can trust the Lord. I can believe what he says because it is true what he says. So, again, that covenant is everlasting. A covenant between a man and a woman. Marriage must be lived continual. Uh, this morning we talked about uh, that Jesus is the bridegroom. And it's an everlasting marriage. And here on earth, salvation, uh, marriage is a picture of salvation. So while we're married to someone, it should be a continual thing. And to be honest with you, if you do it right, which we were supposed to, it will be a continual blessing. Because you've been blessed. And then you're a continual blessing with your spouse, and you're a continual blessing with your children. A covenant between a man and woman must be lived continual. And that's why the Bible says, till death do us part. And listen, I know, you see, that's the beauty of God what I'm about to say. God knows we're not perfect. Divorce will happen. And praise God that he can mend. And those that, that get remarried to someone else, God can bless that. He knows that we're not perfect. But the concept is to be married until death do us part. And you know, a lot of marriages end because they're not a blessing to their spouse continual, because they don't have Jesus in their life to be a blessing. Fawn and I, when we got married, I think it was this, and if you, uh, I think some of you realize this, different states have different rules. Uh, it was a joke in our, it's not really a joke, but we lived close to the Ohio border, not too far, about 30 miles, and a lot of people from Michigan would go to Ohio to get married because Ohio's licenses are a lot easier to get than Michigan. Uh, what I'm saying is Michigan requires certain things. I don't know what they require now, but when we got married, they required that we had to take some classes. And those classes cost money. And I, sometimes I think it's money for the state, but anyway, uh, I won't tell you what the class is about that we took. It's kind of bold, but the state of Michigan made us take it. And the, the, the class got full because once you take this class, you only have a certain amount of days to get married. So you have to do everything in sequence. And you have to go to Detroit to get the license and this, that, and the other. But anyways, we took this class, and I kid you not, I don't know if the guy was saved or not, but the teacher said, look around. I don't know, what, there 40, 50 people there? He said, look around, because within five years, half of you are going to be divorced. I'm telling you, if you don't have Christ-centered home, your marriage will fracture. God hasn't ordered the things. And I don't know if people, if that was a statistic of that class or not, but this class was kind of bold in uh, what it was. See me afterwards if you want to know what the class was about. But it got so specific, I kid you not, there was a guy that turned white as a ghost and passed out. Did he not fall? It got very detailed in, in some areas. Come see me if you want to know uh, what it was about. Uh, when my brother got married, my oldest one, and again, Michigan kind of changes as they go along, but there's always a class, always something you got to pay for. But when my oldest brother got married, he had to take an HIV test, uh, and his wife did. But the thing was, you didn't have to share it with your spouse. So that's what they required at one time. And it's like, what's the use? I mean, you should, <laughs> once you're getting married, you should have to, again, yes, Brother Darrell is money. It was all, it was all money. Uh, so, <laughs> but that's why a lot of people, Darrell, went to Ohio to get married because there was a lot of things. Miss Lynn, I don't know how it was when you got, I don't know if you got married in Ohio. Was it pretty easy? Okay, she said yes. So, yeah, a lot of people went there to get married because it was a lot easier. But anyways, when you get married, it's supposed to be continual. When I was a, a factory worker, 
if I wanted to get paid, I showed up continually. I was there to work. And if you wanted a 40-hour check, and there were sometimes more, but at least if you wanted a 40-hour check, you had to be there 40 hours uh, to collect that check. You had to be in their presence. Lo and behold, they expected you to clock in. They expected you to do your job. So what I'm saying in the contract, I'm trying to get you to think that this contract with Christ, the Bible is saying you have to be in the presence of Jesus. You have to be in the presence of the one who is the contract to be saved. And then when you enter in that contract, it's an everlasting contract. It's continual. It doesn't stop. And that's why well, what I'm saying is, us as Christians, every day, we need to be a continual blessing to others. Because God, uh, Christ is a continual blessing to us. And if you've been blessed, you should be a blessing to others. In Hebrews 13, 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Pleasing in his sight. What it's saying is that God is, uh, there's this thing that we go through. When you're saved, it's called justification. Just as if you never sinned. You've been justified. And then you go through sanctification. Which means God is always working on you. Whether you like it or not, if you're saved, God is working on you. And he's conforming you to be his son. It's good for you that he's doing that. And to paraphrase, I'm going to get ahead of myself, so I may skip over it. But parents, you need to work on your children regardless if they want to be worked on or not. I'm serious. God sets the example. Our Father works on us whether you like it or not. If you're saved and you go off the deep end, he will chastise you. He will correct you. He is constantly conforming you, conforming me, to be more like his son. And what I'm saying is, parents, you need to work on your children so they can be more like Christ. And not just Sundays, not just Wednesdays. Again, if you miss what I'm saying tonight, it's everlasting. It's continual. I don't care if they're over 18 and they're left the house. You have a duty, mom and dad, to work on your children, to conform them like Christ. Hey, son, hey, daughter, uh, are you still in church? Are you still seeking God? You have every right, mom and dad, and you should do that with your children. Fawn is, uh, <laughs> I said this, <laughs> it's funny, Fawn was with me uh, this afternoon, and uh, she was sitting by me as I was typing things up and finishing things, pretending not to see what I was writing, but when I mentioned her name, she's like, huh, what? <laughs> what are you writing? <laughs> but she said something good uh, as, I, as I wrote this. But Fawn is still working on me to be well-pleasing in her sight. And, uh, man, what a blessing. She looked at me and she goes, you are a blessing in my sight. I was like, whoa, wow. But anyways, God is still working to conform us to be more like his son. Uh, we go, like I said, through justification, uh, sanctification, and glorification. God is continually working on us. He is the potter, we are the clay. And he's continually molding us to be like his son. You know why he's doing that? So that you can attract others to his son. That's the purpose. God is blessing you so that you can bless others, uh, to show them the way, to be a joy to them. Show them where they can have joy in their life, to have peace in their life. But God is always working on us. And what this is saying in this verse, to make you perfect, he's equipping us to do his purpose. He's providing. Uh, I still remember Fawn and I, when we went forward and, and surrendered uh, to the ministry, and everybody has a ministry, but to surrender uh, to preach, and we did that for a couple reasons. Uh, we did that so people would pray for us, but we also did that so the church would hold us accountable. And believe you me, Brother Greg came marching in and said, you know what you just did. But as we did that, I, it still cleared me. A, a young man came, and I think God was working on his heart. And I truly believe this. I believe God has called others 
to preach. God has called others to the mission field, and people are just not doing it. But I, I could see that God was just working in his heart, and he came to me, and he said, aren't you worried? If you're a missionary somewhere, where are you going to get a song leader? What are you going to do when this happens? And I simply looked at him and said, if I believe God is leading somewhere, he's going to provide. Plain and simple. God will provide. And that's what this verse is saying. He's making you perfect. He's going to provide. He's going to supply. Again, when I worked in the factory, I did manual labor, and I was on the assembly line. And man, they wanted that assembly line to go nonstop. It didn't stop. If it stopped, someone's got to answer. But anyways, as I was working, I had parts on my station that uh, I had to put on the seats. And there was someone else that was a high-low driver that he would continually go around and make sure that I was stocked so that the line would just keep going. And uh, we were taught this in Michigan, and some people have a misconception. I'm just going to give this little nugget out there. Henry Ford was not the inventor of the vehicle. He was the inventor of the assembly line. That's what he was known for. But to, to keep that assembly line going, God wants us to keep going forward. And he gives us the resources. He gives us the equipment. He gives us everything to do so, to keep going. And by the way, again, this is a sermon on being a blessing. God gives you all the resources to be a blessing to someone else. And we ought to be one. Thank God he's a blessing to us. Beyond measure. And we have no excuse not to be a blessing to someone else. As a saved person, we ought to be a blessing to someone. And I know I'm speaking. Listen, I know I'm talking to the choir this evening. And if you're feeling guilty and come to me, well, I'm a blessing, you're missing the whole point or God's working on your heart. One or the other. But we are to be a blessing every day of the week. It starts at home. It starts if you're married with your spouse. Because God, Jesus, Jesus is our bridegroom. He's a blessing to us. Provides for us. Supplies everything for us. Therefore, as the husband, we are responsible for that. And we're also responsible for training our kids and being the resource for our children. So that they're a blessing to others. One thing that blesses my heart, I love being a blessing. I really don't like receiving things. I love seeing other people happy and smile, especially our children. And man, it really blesses me, and I'm a little biased, I will be, that when my children are a blessing to someone else, it blesses my heart. One, it just says to me that they're doing what God's telling them to do. And they're seeking God first, and they're doing it without being asked. What a blessing. But you see, that's what parents we need. We need to train our kids so that they are. But God has and is conforming us. We need to conform our children and so that they can be a blessing to others. And, uh, uh, next slide. And again, this shows me what, what God is doing in this verse, that we should give him glory. We should be grateful for what he does. Children, you all be grateful for what your parents do. But this also shows me that children are to be grateful for what uh, parents do. Uh, my mother... And I don't ask you guys to do anything that I don't do. My mother at one time had a job. I don't think I shared this before. But she worked at a nursing home. And it was uh, back, oh man, back in the 80s. And they still did things manually. What I'm saying is she would tell me that part of her job was she had to go around and take the pulse and do it for stopwatch and record things. I don't know if anybody remembers that or uh, that was done. But that's what one of her job was. And it was, it was a midnight shift. And it gets cold in Michigan. She wears a coat. And I was about six or seven years old. And in the morning, again, I'm not bragging about myself. I'm just saying what I did. I leave little notes in my mom's coat sleeve. And I say, Mom, I love you. I'm grateful for what you're doing. Even as a little kid, I was, it blessed me that she would work midnights so that the kids will have something extra. And what I'm saying is, children, you ought to be grateful for your parents. And one way of being grateful is showing it. Write them a letter. Tell them how grateful 
you are. In Hebrews 13, 22, And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have wit- written a letter unto you in a few words. And you go to the next slide. Oops. That's okay. That was being a blessing to others. Go ahead and go to the other one. Write a letter. What Paul is saying is, I'm writing a letter. A letter of blessing. A, a, a letter to bless you. To acknowledge you and to encourage you. If you haven't, uh, listen, if God's laying in your heart, and some people have done it here, write a letter to someone. Now we have texting. Text someone. Uh, Fawn and I, throughout the day, we text each other. And there's sometimes, I know she's not to have her, I hope her boss is not watching. <laughs> we, we text each other. And it always gets my heart because I don't do it first. But she'll send me a bunch of emojis of hearts and kisses and hugs and things like that. But we write each other, and listen, I know she's having a hard day. Uh, she tells me things, we talk. Right now, there's something going on at work, and she's having hard days. So why not, as her husband, try and encourage her? What did it take for me to get on the phone and just say, thank you for what you're doing? How's work going? And when I'm out there, I'll get some things. I know I might get her a Mountain Dew or something. And uh, this last time, we were on a health kick, and some of you know this. And uh, I asked her what kind of drink she wanted. She says a Coke. And I said, not a Diet Coke? And uh, I was just teasing with her. You got to know we tease each other. And I said, Fawn, you worked hard. Go ahead and drink a regular Coke. Don't feel bad about it. Because you are working so hard uh, this evening, today. But it only takes a few words to write a letter. We are, again, we are to be an encouragement to others, comfort them, and we are to comfort them with the word of God. I don't know about you, but I don't know if you were dating and you wrote letters, Fawn and I wrote letters to each other, and we continue to do so. Again, what I said is we are to be a continual blessing. Uh, Husband, if that's what you did when you did in the beginning, why aren't you still writing her a letter? And I know I'm probably throwing people under the bus. Thanks a lot, Pastor. Someone's going to tell me I should get a letter. Well, they should. Why not? If you love them, why not tell them? Why not express it to them in a letter? Isn't that what God did? Didn't God give us a love letter? An everlasting love letter? And we ought to do that for our spouses. And we ought to do that for each other. Do it with your children. And I know I shared this with you, and it's going to get me a little bit. And some of you, it might be the first time that you heard this. But Joshua, when he left, that little stinker, he wrote Fawn a, a letter, wrote me a letter, and wrote Harmony a letter. And he left them in the house at areas where he knew that we were a habit in opening up. And he wrote each of us a love letter. What a blessing. That's what I'm saying. We are to train our kids so that they are a blessing to others. And it starts when you're a blessing to your own spouse, a blessing at home. But writing a letter, wherefore comfort one another these words, uh, first Thessalonians 4.18, what words? The word of God. Uh, Specifically in this text, it's talking about the Lord's coming back soon. If someone's having a hard day, tell someone, man, the Lord's coming back soon. He's coming back soon. This is just temporary. Those are encouraging encouraging words to me. This life is temporary. Again, in 1 Thessalonians, uh, wherefore we comfort each other, edify one another, even also ye do. Uh, This is 1 Thessalonians so that 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as so do. Again, this is Christian conduct. This is a sign of being a Christian, of someone encouraging someone else. So when is the last time you wrote someone a letter? I'm sure glad that Jesus penned letters down for me. And I find comfort in this. I find peace, encouragement. And if you're like my wife, or some of you ladies, 
Who's kept some of my letters? Why? Because it's comforting to her. It brings her peace. The Word of God, I don't care how many times you read it, it gives you comfort and peace. And over and over again, most of all, it shows me how much my Savior loves me by giving me his word. Know ye that, our brother, next verse, 23, Timothy is set liberty with whom he have come shortly, I will see you. This is talking about we should not uh, forsake the assembly of ourselves. We ought to be there for one another. This is saying, and God is saying, I'll always be there for you. As a saved person, and if God has brought you to this church, what we are saying to each other is we should be there for each other. And saying, I will be there. You know, bless, there was a funeral not too long ago, and uh, I really didn't know the person, but I went anyway. It was just out of respect. It was something, I, first of all, it was something that God laid in my heart to do. I had no idea that someone else in this church, how it blessed them. I mean, they pulled me over, went to my parsonage over here, and they made it a point and said, Pastor, you never know how much this meant to me. Just by being there. See how much of a, again, this is something that we all can do. We can all encourage someone. We all can write someone a letter. We can all be there when someone is going through a hard time, uh, sickness, or in pain. Salute them all that have rule over you and all the saints that literally. This is saying specifically, if you have an employer, a boss, you ought to greet them. I don't care how mad you're, your boss you are or if you're upset with them, you're employed by them. You ought to be grateful. And you ought to greet them. And this is saying specifically, and it doesn't have to be a long greet. It'll be like that be, I'm just coming here just to say hi. You'll be surprised what encouraging just one word will be to a boss. Or how it may lead them to Christ. But this is specifically telling us that if you have an employer, you ought to thank them. Thank you for being my boss. Thank you for taking the time and being the boss that you are. Just a kind word. I am telling you, kind words, even small ones, go a long way. So we are to greet our bosses. We ought to say hi to them. You ought to be grateful for the job that we have and be there. Uh, they, they kind of, we, we kind of did the extra mile. And I don't want to keep you long, but this is important. Uh, when I worked at Joss Controls, they uh, sent me, gave me a little promotion, if you will. Uh, I got to go to the Ford plant. And really, it was kind of an easy job. And it's credit to Fawn. She made cookies, uh, peanut butter blossoms. They loved them so much that they gave a collection to me that she'd keep on making her cookies. I kid you not. But I was telling them I was grateful that they saw potential in me and, and they, they could trust me. It, doesn't, it didn't take a lot. And my spouse was on board. My wife was on board by doing that. I can't make cookies like that. I can't bake like some of you guys. But man, they, they were so appreciative. And I'm talking about bosses that were kind of mean-spirited, this, that, and the other. And I was just saying, thank you for letting me do this. And uh, here's some cookies that my wife baked. Man, and again, just a quick, hi, how you doing? Drop off cookies. Lo and behold, they cooked up a collection and gave me money to give the fawn to buy more recipe for her cookies. It blessed somebody. It made them happy. And then at the end, uh, grace be with you all. Uh, what it's saying is, may your day be full of peace, joy, and You are happy that someone else is blessed. You're getting to the point. Uh, James or Ty, can you help me out? Uh, I think it's the last slide. You are genuinely happy that someone else is blessed. That they are happy. They are we ought to be that way for others. So what this is saying in the book of Hebrews, and I'll close this, this. Love your neighbor, be hospitable, honor your marriage, place your faith in God for your future. 
uh, the author in it, uh, it appeared to be a sermon as a letter. The author asked for a prayer for the future, restoration for the congregation. The author finishes the letter like the style of Paul. And this says, go and tell others about Jesus. And by the way, I know it's a couple minutes after. I just want to say this about writing a letter. I'm sure glad. Through my preaching, God has given me messages. And I'm bragging on God, not myself. And I hope this does not sound like it's bragging on me. What I'm saying is God has given me messages to write to show this church how much a blessing you are to me. And it's God's words that will go farther than mine. So as I'm writing letters and messages, what I'm doing is writing a love letter that's inspired to God by God for you. And it's for me. So yes, I, I do the same thing. And what I Again, I don't ask you all to do anything that I wouldn't do. Well, you're the pastor, you should be doing this. There's a lot of pastors that aren't doing this. I'll tell you that right now. And to listen to God's word, and, and that's important if you heard what I said. Pin down the words that God gives you. If you're writing it to your spouse, don't be in a hurry. Pray about, and I'm telling you, what God gives you to write to your spouse, she's going to be on cloud nine. God knows her heart. God knows what to say to her heart. God knows the words to encourage that heart. And so be that. Be blessed to be a blessing. As we stand together, there will be an invitation.